You guys say one here this morning, isn't it good to be a Christian? Amen. Been a little uh, under the weather for a few days, so I hope my voice sounds okay and it goes up all right. But uh, I think I'm starting to get out, out of the, back on to the road to recovery, so I hibernated for a couple of days. Um, when I was growing up, I, uh, my mom's mom, who we call Nana, uh, lived in Santa Barbara, California until I was probably uh, in around third grade, she moved back uh, to, to Lubbock and lived in an apartment. We lived in an apartment complex. She moved in just right uh, in the next apartment complex over. And so uh, my grand other grandparents who I grew up pretty much being raised by lived not too far away. But she was a respiratory therapist and she was a, a really good cook. She had uh, a lot of hobbies that she was involved in, kind of an interesting person. Uh, so knitted, uh, was in a bridge club, but one, one of her favorite things to do was to put puzzles together. And she was single, living in a two bedroom apartment, and one room was her sewing room, but in the middle of the room, there was a table, and she would put puzzles together. She would get the most complicated uh, puzzles with uh, the, the, back in that day, sometimes, you know, the, the largest number of pieces or whatever, and she would put those together. And sometimes she would, uh, you know, glue, glue the back and sometimes uh, give those away as presents. It was pretty fascinating. But I remember oftentimes as a kid trying to put you know, puzzles together and, and, you know, she would teach different principles she used or whatever. Um, I had a tendency to force pieces. Uh, she didn't like. It should go in here. And I would bend them and get in trouble. Right. Uh, no dessert for Russell. Anyway, but when you're putting puzzles together, sometimes you, you learn that one of the most frustrating things is when you get a puzzle and it's almost completely put together and then there's a missing piece i remember i remember a couple of puzzles she put together got down to the end and there were just one or two pieces missing and it wasn't a corner it wasn't something way out on the outside that was a, a solid color i mean it was right in the middle right something was missing i remember as a kid uh my grandfather owned a machine shop, made clutches for irrigation engines, and all the cousins and everybody would come and, and work on their cars in his garage because we could lift them up. We had all the equipment there. And I remember as a kid, uh, one of my cousins, his uh, uh, nickname was Bull, all right, because he was, bull, they said he was bullheaded, right? Stubborn. And so my grandfather would often give us tell us things when we were working on cars, like keep up with things as you take something apart, keep up with the pieces, right? Um, and I remember my cousin, he didn't pay attention to that. Uh, my grandfather even gave him some containers and said, you know, put the pieces in here. Pieces were everywhere, right? So carburetors were torn apart. All this stuff was laying out and then we began to try to put everything back together and got to a point where there was a piece missing that you couldn't just go out and find. They had to order it. So that whole thing went for several several days went by and, and I felt sorry for my cousin because that's all, all he heard, right? But we know the importance of keep it up with the pieces because sometimes if just one small piece, I, I, I've over the years worked on things and you think you've got everything back together and there's this one little small screw, screw or spring or something, if it's not there, it's not gonna work. And so I learned a long time ago, you know, have a, have a bucket, uh, tur turn the, when you're taking your lug nuts off, you know, uh, it, whether it's a hubcap or something else, keep all those things together because if you don't, they're going to be gone, right? Um, it's it's uh, 
We understand the principle about the importance of having all the pieces. Spiritually, it's no different. It's important for us to know and to have all the pieces in place. But sometimes we discover there's something missing. And as soon as we discover it, we need to make sure that we get that missing ingredient, that we get that missing part. And the reality is, for most of us, one of the things that's missing is total surrender. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus was calling into a deeper commitment. They were like, Jesus, Jesus, he's our man. He was popular. They followed him around. They listened to him. They enjoyed his miracles. But Jesus knew that if they were going to be his disciples, they had to have a deeper level of commitment, a commitment that would cause them to totally surrender. And so therefore he said, you got to hate your mother, father, brother, sister, or even sit down and consider like a guy building a building or a person going to war. If you're able to pay the cost, and what is the cost? Luke 14, 33, Jesus says, you must give up your very life, everything. Jesus calls for total surrender. And whatever we withhold from God is going to get tested because as soon as we grab onto something and we won't let go, God is going to work on us because he has to have total surrender. Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple unless total surrender. You have to hate, love less, father, mother, brother, sister. You've got to give up everything. And Paul says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer up your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. You have to totally surrender. And part of the way we do that is by yielding to God. Instead of doing our own thing, we yield to God. When you're on the highway and you see a yield sign, what does that mean? You give the right of way to the other person, right? If you're the one that's supposed to be yielding. Sometimes we don't yield to God because we're holding on to something. When Jesus was born, there was he was born in a manger because the Bible says there was no room for him in the end. And I, I think about that. Why didn't they give up a room for Jesus? This is Jesus, the Son of God. Two reasons. They didn't know who he was, and the room was the rooms were full of other people. And in your heart and in my heart, many times, if Jesus isn't there, it's because we don't fully know him, or because our hearts are full of other stuff. And so, total surrender. Jesus knows that our hearts have to be totally surrendered. So this morning, I want us to think about the missing piece, total surrender. And let's look at two ingredients that help us totally surrender ourselves. When I was about to start ministry, I was graduating from Love of Christian. I was about to start my master's, but I was going to become a, a college minister at Sunset while I was working on my, my master's. And I went into Dr. Leon Crouch's office and asked him, you know, as I'm going out from here with, with my degree, I'm going to be a preacher. What are the most important things for me to focus on? And he said, in your ministry, you're going to find that in churches, there's a lack of conviction and a lack of commitment. If you can help people have deeper convictions in their relationship with God, and you can help people deepen their commitment, you'll succeed. And over the years, I've found that when you find people and you help them build their conviction and you help them deepen their commitment, they totally surrender. So that's what I want us to think about this morning. True knowledge that leads to conviction. If you want to totally surrender, you have to become knowledgeable about what God wants. The more you know about something, the more convicted you will become. And therefore, you'll act on your convictions. When you're totally convicted, you know, my background, you know, grew up with martial arts and there's, in Tung Sado, there's, there's, uh, there's the codes and, and there's 
the legend of the Wong Hong warriors that lived up in the mountains and came down. Tong Sado means the way of the China Han, the Tong Dynasty. There's all this history that goes with it. But there was a warrior's code that we would recite every single time we were in the studio. And it started off to build true confidence through knowledge in the heart, honesty, uh, uh, knowledge in the mind, honesty in the heart, and strength in the body. And then, and then it went on. But we would quote that every single time. And when you think about conviction, it's knowledge in the mind and it's honesty in the heart. It's, it's when you know a truth and that truth leaves you no choice but to behave the way you're supposed to behave. There are certain truths in Scripture. There was a point in my life when I believed the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, was to believe and repent and confess and be baptized. And I was convicted of that message. And I knew that at that point, I had to act on that conviction. A few years before that, I was like Jacob and... Uh, I was a little older than them. Uh, some of the kids that pick up the cards at church, uh, when they would stand to do the invitation song, uh, many times the kids would just stay where they were, and then afterwards they would come up front and sit down and then uh, pick up the cards. Well, I thought that I would just go early. So he gives the invitation song, I go sit up in the front to pick up the cards, and he thinks I've come forward to be baptized. He starts asking me these questions and, and uh, I, my heart's going to right? um, I think he's fixing to drag me in the baptistry and I'm already right? And it was a couple of years later that, that I was baptized, but at that point I didn't have the conviction. I knew that some someday I would do it, but I wasn't to a point where I really was beginning to grapple for that answer. What do I to be saved? And if I don't act on this, my soul's in jeopardy. I hadn't come to that conviction that my sin had separated me from God from the standpoint I knew. I knew those things up here, the knowledge, but they hadn't connected to that seat of emotion and intellect and, and all those things. But once I became convicted, there, there was no turning back. Um, there's some things in my life spiritually that I didn't have a lot of conviction about. And so the sa Satan could use that to kind of whip me around until I got to a point where I really believed this is, if Satan can get us to believe that maybe it's not, it's 50 50, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not okay, then we'll play the game. But if we will become convicted that this is what God says, therefore I have no choice. That's what God wants us to be. The reality today is that many people are biblically illiterate. They don't really understand everything the Bible teaches. And we have people that don't have strong convictions about things. We can be kind of wishy-washy. A lot of things have become watered down. Even when you go to the internet for answers, sometimes you don't get clear, concrete truth about what God wants you to know. In our lives, knowledge and understanding the Bible is part of it, but conviction about the way we live and the directions we go is more than just understanding what the Bible says. It's about other things too. When you think about Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, don't lean on your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your steps. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That has to do with our faith, doesn't it? has to do with me leaning totally back and surrendering everything to God. You also have things like in James, if anybody lacks wisdom, when, when you look at life and it seems like a maze and you're looking for direction and you, don't, you can't make heads or tails or things and you don't even know where to begin, Sometimes every day seems like that sometimes. You just face a maze and you don't know where to turn and you're looking for some direction. The Bible says, if you like wisdom, ask God and He will give it to you generously without finding fault. He's no respecter of a person. It doesn't matter 
if you're good looking or ugly, if you're tall or short. It, doesn't, there, it has nothing to do with anything. If you ask God for wisdom, He will give it to you, but you got to believe. You have to have faith. If you live life and you think, I just don't know what God direction wants me to take in life. You're selling yourself short because God provides you with the direction that you need. We can trust in Him. He's going to be present in our lives. And He's going to give us wisdom. And He gives us His divine direction through His Word. He teaches us the things that we need to know and understand to be the kind of people we need to be. In 2 Peter it says, we have everything we need for life and godliness because of this revelation. Um, God gives us guidance. He gives us this book as a compass to lead us through life. In 2 Timothy it says that God's word is inspired. It's God's brief, God brief. All scripture is inspired by God. Every word in this book, the Bible, is God breathed. It's inspired. It's from God. And it's profitable for what? Teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, so that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what will give us conviction. We're told, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That happens when we are connected to God's Word. Some of us lack the conviction that Bible study is worth it. There's more people here now than were an hour ago. Is Bible study worth it? Every single night you have the opportunity to turn your television on, your radio on, uh, I was going to say get a massage. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the gym. <laughs> whatever. Right? Uh, you can pick whatever you want to pick. You can choose whatever you want to choose. Are you convicted that Bible study is worth it? Why do most people not study their Bible? I got a deal in the mail the other day. It's a challenge. Reading the New Testament in a month. And I thought to myself, I'm going to do this. Who can I challenge here in Midway to do this with me? I don't know. We'll, we'll get there in a few weeks. But someone came to my mind automatically. Um, I was going to make Justin do it. Uh, but are we convicted that it's worth it? And do we know how to study it? Several years ago, I came up with a simple approach. We all like probably Oreo cookies. We know what those are. And so just using those letters, O-R-E-O, -E open it. First thing you got to do is open it. And I tell teenagers, sometimes take your Bible, open it up, put it on your pillow. And when you get in bed at night, you got to pick that Bible up to move it. Read something. Read a little. Think about something God says. One verse is better than no verse. Ten verses are better than no verses. A chapter a day, those are important things. There are certain things that we always ask our kids, right? Did you take a shower? Did you put on deodorant? Did you brush your teeth? Did, did you eat all your vegetables? Did you do this or that? It's time to be convicted that the most important thing in this world is their spiritual well-being. Jesus said, what is it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet he, yet he forfeits his soul? Open it, read it, examine it, learn to study the Bible. It's simple. It's not that difficult to get the meaning of what it says from basic terms. Are there some difficult passages? Yes. But you can wrestle through all those things, but learn how to examine Scripture. If you don't know how to do that, that's my job. Come to me and let me help you. And there's some great books, great helps, great things on the internet. You just got to make sure you go to the right places and obey it. And if you want to add an S for Oreos, you can say share it. But for the Bible study part, open it, read it, examine it, 
obey it. How many of you read your Bible every day? How many of you study your Bible every day? There's a difference. The sad reality is we don't study it like we should. And then the second thing is commitment. Conviction and commitment. A total commitment to living for God and not for yourself. There's a story of the rich young ruler. There's the parable where Jesus in uh, Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16, says, Someone in the crowd said, Teacher, uh, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge and arbitrator between you? Then he said, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Remember that. Um, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store these crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tell down my barns, I'll build bigger ones, and then I'll store up the surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, be married. And God said to him, you fool. Does God look at our lives and have a right to say, you fool? This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you prepare for yourselves? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And then there's the story of the rich young ruler where he comes to Jesus and says, what I got to do to inherit eternal life? And he says, keep the commandments. He says, I've done all that. And Jesus said, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and come and follow me. And what does it say? The rich young ruler couldn't do it. He couldn't totally surrender. His commitment took him to Jesus and he was asking good questions. He wanted to do what was right. He wanted to in inherit eternal life. How many of you want to live forever? How many of you want to live forever with God? How many of you want eternal life? I think we all do. He wanted it. But he said, what do I got to do to get it? And Jesus said, keep the commands. And he says, I've done all that. And Jesus says, the one missing piece was his total surrender. His commitment was limited to a certain point. He wanted to be right and to have eternal life, but he wanted to hold on to what he enjoyed and what he liked. And he turned and walked away. And the spookiest thing to me is, Jesus didn't walk down the road and chase him and beg him. He let him go. Your commitment has to be your commitment. Jesus isn't going to chase you down the road. Amen. He's going to call you to commitment and you have to decide, am I going to be committed or not? And it's so easy to go through the motions of being a Christian. Jesus, when he went to the cross, did not go through the motions. He laid his life down for us. He didn't kick against God's will. And too many of us, we go through the motions. We're at church. We look good. We got suits and Ties on maybe, we you know, we at least brushed our teeth, whatever. We're here, we're presentable, we showed up. But if we're punching a ticket, that's not enough. That conviction has to lead to a commitment that is unwavering. He didn't have a commitment. Do you? Are you withholding something from God? God is called in us to totally surrender. Jesus said, you have to give up everything. The Apostle Paul said, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That means even though you can breathe and move, you've given your life to God. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, Christ died so that he, we would no longer live for ourselves, but for Him who died for us and is risen again. Absolute, total, 100% surrender is based on the conviction and the commitment 
we have in Christ. Jesus is calling you to that kind of commitment. It's a 100% commitment. It's a radical commitment. It's a commitment will to call, that will cause you to do some things in your life where your friends and family will say, what? When I was a teenager, there was some people that would always ask if I would loan them money. And my parents used to preach at me all the time. Don't be giving people money. People will take advantage of you. And they would give me the stories about the stray dog showing up and you feeding it. You know, they'll keep coming back for more and all that kind of stuff. But I was a kid who was reading my Bible and it said, if somebody asks you for help, give it to them and don't expect it in return. I was just being sincere about a conviction that I had. Now, did I have to learn that sometimes people will take advantage of you? Did I have to learn that you have to be as innocent as a dove and as wise as a serpent? Yes, I did. Did I have to learn to balance that out? But there was a moment in time where I just took it for what it said. If somebody asks you for something, give it to them and don't expect anything in return. And some of what I did was, the, was right. That was the right thing to do. There was, there was some times where there were some people that if I would have really thought about it, I might not have helped them, but I, I, I helped them and it made a difference. Where are your convictions? Are your convictions right? You can be wrongly convicted about something, can't you? You can have a conviction about something and be dead wrong. If you got on the internet and you start asking questions about some biblical topics, the second coming of Christ, baptism, instruments in worship, whatever, you, you, you name it, you start throwing some things out there, women's role in the church, divorce, stuff, stuff like that, you're going to get some people that have some very strong convictions. Some of those convictions are dead right and some of those convictions are dead wrong. How do you find out? You've got to get your convictions from here. Don't listen to me and go out and say, well, Russell said it, I'm going to die for it. Don't do that. I said it. You go read it. You go figure it out. You go settle in it. You go get your convictions from here. And then say, Jesus said it, I'll die for it. Jesus said it, there's no compromise. But we live in a time where too many people are too shaky. And something happens and their faith goes. It goes. Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? He's going to find it in people that are totally surrendered, that have conviction and commitment. Or are you going to be one of those people? Is Jesus calling you today? Arise and be baptized and let your sins be washed away. Answer the call as we stand and sing.